Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, uh, we're here to hear from uh, Chloe Udaly and Mingus Mapp. Um, Chloe is the commissioner in, for position four and Mingus is running against her. Um, I thought we would just start off by having both of you give just a, a minute or two introduction and why voters should choose you over your opponent. Um, and why don't we start with um, Chloe to go first? Sure. Great. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having us today. My name is Chloe Daly. I am the current commissioner uh, in position four for Portland City Council. I was born in Portland, raised in rural Oregon. I spent the 30 years leading up to my run for office as a activist, a community advocate, and a small business owner. I did not uh, anticipate a life in politics. It really felt like a calling and I was called to run for city council by our housing crisis and the impact that it had on my own family and tens of thousands of renters in our community. I largely ran on that issue. I won on that issue and I've advanced the strongest tenant protections that Portland renters have had since World War II. I'm really pleased and proud of the work that I've been able to accomplish uh, working hand in hand with community and centering the least well-served uh, community members among us. And I am excited to get to continue to build on that good work. I love this city and that's why I'm running. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, and Mingus? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here today and organizing this event. Also, thank you for um, providing me with this opportunity to seek your endorsement and to everyone watching at home. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to ask for your vote. Um, I'm running for Portland City Council because I love our city, but I'm also deeply concerned about the direction that we're going in. Um, I think we all know that we face an unprecedented basket of crises right now, and the choice that you make, uh, both in your endorsement and your vote, uh, will have a huge impact on the direction our city goes next. One of the things I'm going to ask you to do over the course of the next hour is to think about what you want out of a city commissioner. I've been thinking about that question a lot over the past year, and here are some of the things that um, seem to be important to me. I think a good city commissioner um, is um, a bridge builder. Uh, uh, you know, you have to be able to find at least two votes on city council in order to get anything done. Uh, in order to be a good city commissioner, you also have to be a good manager because un under our form of government, every member of city council is also the chief operating officer for at least one city bureau. And in order to be a good city uh, commissioner, you also have to be a good listener and a fast learner. Um, one of the arguments that I'm making in this campaign campaign is that the incumbent unfortunately fails on all of those accounts. Instead of building bridges, she burns them. Uh, um, we are all familiar with the chaos in the, her, the bureau that she runs, the Office of Civic Life. And um, I think one of the uh, um, sad facts about her leadership is too many Portlanders feel like they have not been heard by the incumbent who represents them. Me, on the other hand, I believe that I um, excel at all of those skills. Um, I'm a bridge builder, which is evidenced by the enormous and uh, um, remarkable coalition that I've put together. I've been a public servant who has served with honor and distinction. Um, I'm a lifelong learner and a good listener. Um, I'm also a dad and a Democrat. I'm a progressive and I'm pragmatic. I have deep roots in Portland. I did my undergraduate work at Reed College and then went on to get a PhD in government from Cornell University. I've split my career between being a public servant uh, here in Portland and being an academic. My academic research focuses in on urban politics. My public service has been uh, in policymaking positions at the city of Portland, Multnomah County, Portland Public Schools. You know, all of those experiences have taught me a lot about how Portland works and how we can make Portland work better. Um, when I'm on uh, city council, I'll have an agenda which is both uh, progressive and pragmatic. If I were to identify four or five uh, top concerns right now, I would uh, list things like um, helping the city recover from our COVID crisis, social justice, police reform, reducing homelessness, bringing more affordable housing to the city, and charter reform. I think it's time that we increase the number of seats on city council, we change the way we fill those seats, and we direct city council to hire a city manager. Now, I know these changes aren't going to be easy, but, you know, Portland has a history of doing great things. I'm a political scientist and in this race today because I grew up in Portland at a time uh, when we accomplished remarkable things. I believe that if we change leadership and come together, we can accomplish great things again. 
So I was going to get into this a little bit later, but um, I, I do want to give Chloe a chance to respond to uh, some of your criticisms, Mingus. Um, Chloe, as, as the commissioner in charge of the Office of Community and Civic, Civic Life, you've taken a lot of criticism for, uh, from neighborhood groups for um, uh, some of the proposals you're advancing regarding reworking city code relating to neighborhood associations and changes in the neighborhood crime prevention program. I'm wondering if you can respond to that and kind of detail uh, where things are at and, and what your plans are moving forward on that. Sure, uh, thanks for the question. So, you know, as I think everyone's aware, I inherited a pretty troubled bureau that came along with a, a critical auditor's report and all of my work uh, has really been informed by that audit and trying to address the many issues that the auditor raised, including the inequities within our neighborhood association system. Um, I'm really proud of the work that the Code Change Committee did, and I stand behind their recommendations. It's unfortunate that there was a concerted uh, campaign against code change before those recommendations were even finalized or given to me, before I had a real chance to uh, work with a broader community outside of that committee. And we were really kind of put in a, a defensive position the so let me ask you, how many, I mean, were neighborhood associations courted and, and not just select ones, but just the neighborhood association network as, as a whole to participate in these, these uh, uh, committee discussions? So there was a serve, and forgive me because this is going back a few years now, uh, which now feels like a decade. Uh, so there was a survey with hundreds of respond, uh, responses before the code change committee was formed. The Code Change Committee itself had several people representing uh, current or former members of neighborhood associations and neighborhood coalitions. And uh, the next phase was engaging with those neighborhood associations. Code change wasn't universally rejected by the neighborhood, associa uh, neighborhood associations. There were some that endorsed it. There were some that actively opposed it. And I'd say most of them sat out of that conversation. We, uh, between Director Re, my liaison at the time, liaison at the time, went to Johannes and myself, met with dozens of neighborhood associations and probably hundreds of people over the course of finalizing the code change. Um, and we accommodated the kind of requests and demands that came from different communities, neighborhood associations, and the considerable uh, coalition of community-based organizations that came together to support code change. It's very simple. We have a neighborhood association system that doesn't reflect the full diversity of our city. Neighborhoods are a completely valid way to organize and identify and their work will remain vital uh, despite what some people will say, this was never about dismantling the existing neighborhood association network. It was about expanding it. But if the city of Portland claims to care about equity and racial justice and diversity, we cannot rely on a group, solely rely on a, a neighborhood network that isn't reflective of our full community. So. The real goal of code change was to acknowledge the ways that pe people choose to organize and identify and just make a bigger table. So yes, they were absolutely engaged. And I will say, um, you know, virtually all of my major policy pieces have passed with four, if not five votes. So I reject the assertion that I'm not a bridge builder and I can't work with my colleagues. I've got a very long list of accomplishments that uh, where I either collaborated with or was fully supported by my colleagues. Code change was a rare exception. But uh, after that final community meeting, I still had three votes. I didn't have Commissioner Hardesty, who I was really hoping to bring on board, and made the decision at that time that I didn't want to advance code change without uh, without fuller support. So we decided to kind of change 
the process and do a lot of the internal work that we needed to do in order to advance code change. Unfortunately, that was delayed by COVID. Um, I, don't, I don't feel that this is a time to try to conduct a major, uh, major amendments to the code where we can't, we're still kind of struggling to do meaningful public engagement. So it is on hold. And uh, whoever the next commissioner may be, uh, because there'll be a big rearrange in January of all the bureaus, I, I hope, you know, if it's me, I will continue that work. If it's a new commissioner, uh, I hope they will continue to look at um, the challenges with our existing system, which have been acknowledged by the very groups, you know, who were opposing. This is a 30 year conversation about the lack of diversity in our neighborhood system. I think everyone agrees that it has to change. We don't necessarily agree, agree on how to change it. And um, Mingus, I have a question for you, but, it, but I don't wanna to delve too deeply into this because I, I really do wanna focus more uh, back on police and housing. Um, but Mingus, um, do you, I mean, do you agree that the Neighborhood Association um, network is problematic in failing to adequately represent uh, the full diversity of Portland's residents? Um, I think there's room for improvement in the neighborhood association system. Uh, this is also a distinction between the incumbent and myself. I believe if there's a problem in one of my bureaus, it's my obligation to fix the problem and not to undermine the institution that I'm supposed to run. So that's a change that you'll see when I'm in that seat as opposed to, uh, to Commissioner Udaly. And then the other thing I'd like to point out is I, I believe the commissioner deeply misrepresented the reality that's happening over at the Office of Civic Life. I think the Oregonian itself has uh, reported on a report released by the Ombudsman within the last week or two, which talked about not just mismanagement in the Office of Civic Life. It actually talks about efforts in City Hall to uh, to uh, disrupt efforts to investigate mismanagement at the Office of Civic Life. You know, it's one thing to be bad at your job. It's another thing to uh, uh, um, undermine efforts to investigate that. I feel like that is a fundamental and profound violation of public trust. So Helen, I, I have to respond to that because my opponent has repeatedly misrepresented what is happening. Number one, there is no auditor's report. There is an ombudsman memo. That memo represented complaints that have been lodged against uh, bureau leadership that are not substantiated. Uh, I and my office worked with the ombudsman. Please don't interrupt me. I know you're fond of that, but I, I, it's, I have the floor. Uh, we worked with the ombudsman, the city attorney, and the Bureau of Human Resources to come up with a plan to move forward, which was contracting with an outside consultant to do a full assessment. I was surprised at the end of the day because I am not in charge of this process. The city attorney is leading this process, that the ombudsman was not satisfied uh, with what had been settled on, uh, but to characterize me as trying to um, sabotage or prevent an investigation is just absolutely false. Can you say what you're, you're doing in response to uh, what Marjorie Tellinger wrote? So I sent a couple messages out to Bureau staff um, encouraging everyone that has a complaint to please take it to BHR. And we are proceeding with this uh, outside consultant and assessment uh, under the advice of both the city attorney and uh, the Bureau of Human Resources in order to uncover whatever kind of dysfunction is going on in the Bureau. Because unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily rise to the level of an HR complaint, but there's obviously issues that need to be uncovered and need to be resolved. So I'm really looking forward to the outcome of that assessment. And it may be that that consultant discovers violations that do rise to the level of an HR complaint. And so I'm just repeatedly encouraging uh, those employees to bring their complaints if they're not satisfied with the response from their supervisor, their manager, their director to bring it to HR for, for a full investigation. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I, I would like to, to talk about police and um, I, 
don't remember where we were supposed to start now, but um, Mingus, let me ask you, you've talked sure. about um, your vision for public safety and that police should not be, not to build police at the, as the center of it. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, what you're thinking about and just what um, other agencies or uh, personnel you imagine kind of contributing to that public safety picture? Sure, I'm glad that you asked this question. Um, it is profoundly important to me. You know, I'm an African American and a black dad. I got a 10 year old and an 11 year old. Um, you know, um, it's not a coincidence that I have spent much of my professional career trying to reinvent uh, policing here in Portland. Um, I have skin in this game. And you know, America is never going to be truly um, a free country until we figure out how to provide basic city services like public safety to families who look like mine. Um, I'm very much a canary in the coal mine um, on this question. Um, you know, and that's frankly why a black guy with a PhD devotes his life to some very unromantic uh, uh, work around trying to bring community uh, policing to cities like Portland. Um, and you know, I think I would say that this is not rocket science. My family is not so different from your family or Commissioner Udaley's family or anyone else's family on this call. Um, you know, I want zero tolerance in our policing uh, policies and our policing systems. I want a police department that's worthy of our trust. I think our public safety system should emphasize prevention, restorative justice, and rehabilitation. Um, I also think that our policing policies should be based on uh, science and evidence. Let's make sure that the things we do uh, um, are actually grounded in some research. And then I think we should have the um, courage to actually evaluate our work. Um, and then I think that we should do really some common sense things like getting the police out of the business of being uh, our first responders are me on mental health calls. You know, uh, literally, I believe 49% of our 911 calls are essentially sending out police to respond to a houseless person who's going through some mental health crisis in a public space. I think that we need to get the cops out of that business and embrace programs like the um, like the streets response teams where we sent out a mental health worker and someone who's trained in uh, conflict uh, de-escalation. I also think that it's time that we de-escalate uh, the militaristic responses that we see uh, in our police department to uh, situations that involve crowd control. That's why I called on the, on the uh, police commissioner to stop the use of rubber bullets and tear gas. Um, I also would say that um, um, in terms of what you can expect from me when I'm on city council. Um, you know, I support Commissioner Hardesty's ballot measure uh, to uh, reinvent how we do police accountability. And when I'm on council, I'll work hard to make sure that that actually works. Again, a zero tolerance policy around public safety policies is important to me. This literally determines how I live and whether or not I live through the day. Um, I call, I'm going to call on the mayor to stop the practice of being the uh, police commissioner. I think that has proven itself to be a system that just does not work. And I have to say, I do not support defunding the police, but I do support reimagining the police. I think we need to start this discussion over with an emphasis on what is it that we actually want from our public safety system. And then let's talk about the kind of programs that will deliver that to us. Um, some of those programs may uh, exist in the police department. Some of those programs may exist in other city bureaus. Some of those uh, programs might just exist out in the um, in the public sector or in the nonprofit profit sector. You know, one of the things that I think that we need to do with this moment is to um, take this opportunity to pause and come together as a community to figure out how we reinvent uh, public safety for the 21st century. So it works for families like mine, because when it works for families that look like me, it will work for families that look like yours. You're on mute, Helen. Let me follow up on that. Um, you mentioned uh, calling on um, uh, the police chief to halt use of tear gas and rubber bullets. When was that? Because it seems that you were very quiet throughout the vast majority of the protests in terms of what your position was, um, anything along those lines, the kinds of things that we would have expected a city council candidate to come out with. Oh, sure. Uh, literally months ago, uh, my, my staff can get you the email. I think we even did a press release you might check. Uh, um, to take a look. Uh, this has not been, we, we, this has not been a newly discovered position on our part at all. Uh, but I have literally had sta uh, staff uh, reach out, or if I've reached out to the mayor's staff on almost a, on a weekly basis to um, frankly offer critiques about how well or how poorly things are going. Um, so yeah, this is not 
a new position on my part at all. Okay, I will follow up with with your staff. Thank you. Great, thank um, you. And Chloe, I want to get to the question of uh, defunding. Um, earlier this year, you sought you sought deeper cuts to the police budget than just the defunding of the three specialty units. Um, however, in the past couple months, shootings and murders have spiked in the city. Um, and we recently had a story about police not responding for 90 minutes to multiple 911 calls about an intruder with a knife. Do you feel that the police bureau has a personnel it needs to provide public safety? Thanks for the question, Helen. I mean, I have been asking that of the police bureau and my colleagues for the four years that I've been in office as the police in 2018 asked for a significant uh, position, increase in position and authority of 100 officers. No rationale has ever been provided to me as to uh, what, what we should base uh, police staffing on. So it's very hard to say whether or not they have the resources that they need. Uh, I, my, my instinct is that this has more to do with priorities and leadership. And I have to say, you know, I was the first commissioner to call for a ban on tear gas very early in the protests. And I'm currently working on a munitions reduction or restriction ordinance with Commissioner Hardesty. Um, and uh, I have seen time and time again, whether I publicly criticize the Bureau or whether I'm trying to advance some kind of policy change, a reaction, a really negative reaction in the Bureau. Um, so there is definitely a, a lack of information and a lack of trust right now, not just between community and police, but between the community and the council. At times it feels that the police bureau are a rogue bureau and that we have very little control over them. I mean, the reality is that we have past councils have bargained away so much of our power uh, that we have to pay settlements to get rid of bad cops. And despite six different police commissioners and 10 different police chiefs over the last 20 years with various philosophies and approaches, we've seen no meaningful change the biggest barrier to change is the police union. And while I am happy to hear my opponent's uh, police reform platform, because as you said, he has been somewhat silent and that, that plat public platform has been somewhat lacking, it's mostly constitutes things that we have either already done or are doing, and he's endorsed by the police union. I don't think the police union needs a stronger voice on city council. We need a unified council that's ready to do this uh, deep work hand in hand with the community to reimagine and transform our entire approach to public safety and policing. I can't say I disagree with anything that he just said as far as uh, potential reforms, but I do think reducing position authority and budget is one of the uh, few tools we have to reshape the Bureau. But I would say before we make further cuts, I wanna make sure that we have systems in place to respond to uh, the needs that we've currently left up to the police, such as mental health um, issues and homelessness. So let me follow up on that because um, earlier this year, you were calling for an additional cut of, I think, a roughly 5 million. Um, yeah. if, you, if you don't feel that you have the information to make um, informed decisions about what to cut and, and, and how much to cut, why would you advance that proposal? That was um, based on vacancies and upcoming retirements. Uh, so with the limited information that I do have, I felt quite comfortable that we could cut that position authority, achieve uh, greater cost savings in the Bureau, reinvest that $5 million in in community. And I mean, that's really what this conversation is about. It's not that we don't need a public safety system. It's that we are failing as a society to address so many needs in the community uh, that we then rely on police to resolve. And if we don't, you know, 
whether it's homelessness um, or actual crimes, if we don't begin investing in community-based solutions and truly preventing crime by building a society that doesn't lead people to have to commit, especially crimes of survival, which so many of our calls to uh, the police are about, then, then we're, we're never gonna make progress on, on this issue. Thank you. Um, Mingus, um, Chloe raised a criticism that's been uh, leveled at you regarding the donation you received from the Portland Police Union. What would you tell voters who question whether you're going to be able to um, stick to this promise to ensure that the next police contract is going to hold police uh, to a greater level of accountability? Sure. Well, uh, thank you for bringing up this important topic. Uh, one of the things I want to point out is that um, Black people are getting killed in the streets of Portland in record numbers, numbers we have not seen since literally the, the crack ep epidemic of a generation ago. Nothing that I've heard from uh, the incumbent uh, makes me feel safer, and I'm pretty sure nothing she said or is proposing actually makes my family safer um, or, frankly, your family safer. Uh, what, do, what will make us safer, I think what will make us safer is to coming together as a community uh, to talk about what we need and expect from public safety. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why the police, um, frankly, endorse me. Um, I've been out working on community policing issues for years now. If you're the kind of cop who goes to uh, uh, community meetings, you have definitely met me. And if you've met me, you know I'm a constructive guy who's worked hard to, uh, um, who's worked hard to, um, uh, make our community safer without relying on police. Uh, no one has more investment in um, in, um, uh, the, in getting racism out of our public safety than I do. Um, again, I think that the way we, we make communities safe is by frankly displacing the police from the center of our public safety system and bringing communities together. I've done that over and over again. You know, my key recipe is, you know, when we have problems, let's pull together the neighbors and the businesses and the churches and the schools and the houseless people and talk about how we can be better neighbors to each other. Um, I think when we pursue that approach, we get real results. I've proven that out in Park Rose and I've proven it over in the crime prevention program, which frankly, it's worth noting that the incumbent has dismantled. Um, so if you if that if that's your vision for public safety, if you want to build a public safety program that puts people first, I think you should look at me. If you want to prevent crime, I think that you should take a look at who I am. And if you think that somehow I'm going to implement a racist public safety system, I would say that you should look at me. Okay, so I have not dismantled uh, the crime prevention program. It was uh, more of a programmatic transformation to community safety which uh, very closely echo echoes mo much of what my opponent just described as being his priorities. We moved away from an outdated 1970s National Sheriff's Association model, a punitive model based on fear and toward community-based solutions, which is exactly what the community is calling for in this moment. I'll just say since the, my opponent didn't address your question about being endorsed by the police union, that I've taken a pledge to never accept money uh, from the police union. And let me ask about that. I mean, is um, the, actually, you know, I, I wanna stick to this other question, sorry. Mingus, can you tell me like specifics in the police union contract that concern you that, um, you know, oh, you sure. noted. Um, absolutely. Well, uh, the question of the day is definitely around um, accountability and how do we go about bringing accountability uh, to cops when, when they do things that are wrong. Um, and that, that um, building that system, and what we should also note is that clearly Portland's system for building a police accountability has failed. Literally, the people who run the system say this is not working. So we obviously we got to move forward. My idea is um, let's embrace uh, Commissioner Hardesty's proposal. Uh, um, to uh, um, develop uh, changes to the charter that bring about a uh, real and meaningful change to how we go about providing for police accountability. Now, part of what that new system looks like, frankly, will live in the contract. Part of it will live in city code. Part of it might even might even require changes to state law. And frankly, if you look at the proposal that voters are going to um, ask or be asked to vote on in, in November around uh, uh, police reform, there are a lot of those details which are um, 
haven't been filled in yet. But if the question is, you know, how do we as Portland come together to police black people? One of the things I think is really important is that city council have some black men on the council. Right now we don't. And frankly, we've only had two um, in the whole history of the city. You know, um, this is how you wind up with bad policies that wind up killing people. Um, that's what I hope to do is to sort of represent everyone from you know people who look like me to people who look like the commissioner. Um, I, I'm a systems and institutions guy. We're going to have to make changes to both the charter and the ordinances and I think to frankly uh, state law and frankly to our politics. Um, one of the things that I think is very tragic about Portland um, at this point is we do a terrible job of actually listening to each other and hearing each other. When I listen to what Portlanders are saying about public safety, whether it's from uh, beat cops or to you know Black Lives Matters um, activists, I think they're saying the same thing. You know, uh, cops know that they don't uh, prevent crime; they respond to crime. I think everyone wants a community that is strong enough and supported by City Hall in a way that allows us our communities to be safe, connected. Um, but when you need a cop and you dial nine one one, there's someone to uh, um, to pick up the phone call. I'll tell you a story that happened to me um, just a couple of days ago. Commissioner Udaley has a constituent over at about 90th and. Though. Lives an old lady lives next to a drug house. Um, been working this problem forever, but the um, now she has no one to call at the city. Uh, she calls the police about problems, problems and crimes and threats that are happening there, and there's no one uh, to take those calls anymore. And that you know I been around the system for a little bit. She called me, I sort of picked up the phone and I called some folks I know over at the police department to say, what should this lady do right now? This little old lady who's been at Flavel and for like 50 years, uh, um, diligently documenting the crimes that are happening right next door. Um, and I'll tell you, people, the, the police officers told me, I'm sorry, Mengus, we're just not in that business anymore. It breaks our heart and I'm ashamed of it, but that's, you know, that's the reality. We don't actually do that kind of policing. We don't do community engaged policing anymore. What we do is we get in our cars and we respond to 911 calls. I would argue that that is not serving our city well and it's time for change. Great, thank you. Um, Chloe, the city has adopted Vision Zero, the goal of ach achieving zero traffic deaths. Um, what role does traffic enforcement and Portland police specifically play in achieving that? Well, that has been uh topic of conversation in these last few months uh, with my office and bureau, we are exploring uh, what it would take to move traffic enforcement out of the police bureau and into PBOT. Unfortunately, the power to do so uh, is uh, not something we possess locally. It would require constitutional changes. So we're having to look at um, equitable enforcement practices within the constraints, you know, placed on us by the state. We've convened, we're convening a task force to explore those issues. And, you know, one of the best solutions are radar cameras. Radar cameras uh, do not have bias against uh, people uh, on the front end. They certainly, they're just triggered by the speed or red right, light running. Um, they minimize interactions between members of the public and police. They avoid, you know, car chases, which can end in tragedy on our streets. So that is uh, one area we're looking at. It's a fascinating issue because our Bureau, at least, doesn't consider traffic enforcement as a core function. They really gutted that um, division several years ago around the time that the gun uh, gang enforcement task force was set up. I don't know that there's a direct correlation, but I think it certainly um, shows what the priorities were. But the fact is there are more people drive, dying in traffic fatalities than there are um, dying in homicides. And also, as we know, um, there have been some tragic interactions between Black Portlanders uh, and police while driving, such as Keaton Otis and Kendra James. So very interested in tackling that issue. Um, it's, it's, going to, it's going to take work. It's not something that we can achieve with a simple policy change at the local level. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Amy, do you want to jump in? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, I stopped my video because my internet 
and was not so great. But um, so this question is for both Chloe and Mingus. Um, and I, I guess, Chloe, you just spoke, so I guess Mingus will, can answer first. Uh, you both state that you're interested in increasing the supply of affordable housing in Portland by offering incentives to private sector developers. But developers um, sometimes argue that the cost of building affordable housing can exceed the cost of building market rate housing. Can you specify how you would overcome that obstacle? Uh, sure. I think one of the problems that we have in Portland is, um, Frankly, City Hall uh, stands in the way of bringing more affordable housing to our community. That happens in a couple of forms. Both it happens in the fees that we charge um, in order to bring affordable housing online. It happens through our permitting process, which I think anyone who has ever uh, tried to build something in Portland will tell you are Byzantine and dysfunctional. And it happens uh, with inspections, which can take years uh, or probably not years, but months. Uh, um, people who tell me, who people who are in the affordable housing game tell me, you know, if I want to do a major project here in Portland, it could take me two years to get the plans approved by the city. Um, and that's why we no longer do affordable housing uh, um, in this city. That's why I think that we need to change priorities and change our focus. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a political scientist. I'm very much um, um, evidence-based. I'm um, One of the things that I believe actually works in this world are incentives. So if we want certain kinds of outcomes, I think that we should provide incentives to make them happen. Uh, that's why I think that we should reduce fees for um, affordable housing. Um, that's why I think we should speed up the inspection process for affordable housing. And I think that's why we should simplify the permit, permitting process for affordable housing. Thank you. Chloe, do you need me to repeat the question or? No, I it? think I've got it. Um, you know, I'm really proud of a lot of the work that we've done that we did at BDS. For instance, I inherited a $10 million uh, permitting software boondoggle and successfully saw that through. Developers can now not only apply for permits online, but submit their plans online for the first time ever in the city of Portland, uh, which is unbelievable to me, but it's true. Um, I also brought back the small business concierge to help small time developers and uh, community based organizations navigate our permitting system because I agree it is complex, it is expensive, it is time consuming, and it is not designed uh, for small time operators. I worked closely with the mayor's office to resolve a lot of the bottlenecks in the permitting, pro uh, permitting process. It's really challenging that we don't have a public work system. We have, I think, five individual bureaus that work out of the permitting office. So while the public may see the permitting office as belonging to BDS, it actually belongs to five different bureaus and we can only be as fast as our slowest permitting <laughs> uh, bureau. So it's very challenging. Um, I would say, uh, you know, we've seen hundreds, we're possibly into the thousands now of affordable units that have been generated by our inclusionary zoning requirements, by multi. Uh, I recently uh, guaranteed that affordability was a requirement in our expanding opportunities for affordable housing. Uh, I think code change that we just passed, I was instrumental in better housing by design and RIP. I see uh, a lot of opportunities moving forward to generate more uh, housing and more affordable housing. Um, you know, I, I do sometimes laugh when developers complain because we just had a massive development boom. If it was too expensive to develop in Portland, um, that certainly wouldn't have happened. We have thousands of empty units. So I feel that the industry, you know, is a little disingenuous in this conversation, but it's certainly worth exploring. Uh, I want to say we also have reduced the uh, SDC charges for affordable housing developments. We've done a lot of the stuff that my opponent uh, raises. I made the SDC waiver for ADUs uh, permanent, for example, if you're if a homeowner is building uh, long term rental, not we're not going to subsidize the short term rental industry. Um, but 
I mean, I could go on and on. I have really come at this issue from, from all sides. There's, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and I'm really excited to get to continue to do that work. Well, Chloe, I wanted to follow up with a question. Um, you have, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. My computer's going in and out. <laughs> so, uh, so you have introduced and supported a number of changes that give greater protection to renters, including a rent moratorium. Should the city or county do anything to assist landlords whose renters aren't paying rent? Yeah, I, I want to emphasize while while my focus is on renters because renters are more vulnerable to eviction, they are lower income and they, you know, they're the biggest risk as, as this crisis uh, continues for eviction, displacement and homelessness. But I have also been fighting for homeowners. We know that a third of our homeowners were already cost burdened before this uh, crisis. And, and now that number is certainly greater. Yes, absolutely. When we talk about rent forgiveness or mortgage forgiveness, which is also a priority for me, that obviously has to come with relief to landlords and relief to lenders. That is not something that we can do on the local or even state level. We, we ha the federal government has to intervene uh, to stave off what is being described as a tidal wave of evictions and foreclosures. We know that there are certain interests who want that to happen namely uh, massive uh, property investment firms and, and Wall Street investment firms waiting with bated breath and billions of dollars to buy up uh, even more of our rental properties. Uh, and we are gonna have to work together at the local state and federal level to, to guarantee that doesn't happen. Are you already doing that work on the federal level, uh, reaching out or lobbying to, to work I mean, on that? Yeah, absolutely. Advocating, lobbying. Um, on the local level, you know, we're, we have been pursuing anti-displacement measures the whole time I've been in office. The, um, one of the top priorities right now is a tenant opportunity to purchase uh, policy, which gives tenants the first right of refusal, and then working with nonprofits, creating affordable housing opportunities for low-income renters. So, well, that is not uh, going to, to solve the crisis that we're facing. It is uh, one of many measures that we can take to keep people housed and actually get them out of renting and into home ownership and building wealth, which is uh, a priority for me. But in terms of um, other actions you can take on the city level or in concert with the county and state, you're not looking at anything in particular that would um, either incentivize or assist landlords who are, you know, not getting any rent, but are going to be facing big property tax bills in November, for instance, that, you know, uh, there's nothing that you're looking at or have any ideas on that level. So everyone holds a different piece of this, right? We all have specific powers and kind of scopes. We all have uh, limited resources. Uh, the property taxes would be a county conversation and that actually hasn't come up. What I will say, what I feel is happening at all levels of government with these eviction moratoriums in particular is that we're just trying to buy time because we haven't hit bottom yet and there's, we can't build a bridge. There's, there's no other side to this in sight yet. And uh, it seems to me that these are really stopgap emergency measures. And as we get a clearer picture of what recovery is going to look like, then, uh, then we will start pursuing a, a variety of possibilities to keep people in their homes, whether they're renters or homeowners. So, um, it's a priority for me. It's not something entirely within my power. I've pitched a number of ideas uh, to our state and federal partners. There's a bill uh, in Congress, uh, Congresswoman, uh, Congressman Omar. Uh, I'm, I'm 
I can't remember the title of the bill, I'm sorry, but it is rent and mortgage forgiveness with that uh, landlord and lender relief, as well as creating a fund to buy up rental properties that may, you know, distressed properties to preserve naturally affordable, naturally occurring affordable housing. Is there any concern that, um, you know, that these are, and, and this is kind of where that question about what other forms of relief are you looking for people up the chain is, um, you know, a clear, there's a clear public interest and benefit in keeping people in their homes. Um, and the government has acted to protect that. But the risk of that is being shifted onto a group of private individuals. You know, certainly uh, there are going to be different individuals of um, varying degrees of ability to handle that. Um, is that, um, I mean, does that kind of uh, speak to you at all? Just this idea that you're asking this, this group of individuals to bear the burden of a uh, governmental goal and objective? Yes, I mean, I would say that in this uh, viral pandemic where keeping people indoors and safely distanced uh, is critical to flattening the curve of the spread of the virus, that this has had to be a priority. I mean, what would we do if we saw our homeless population increase by 50%, which is what some of the um, forecasts uh, suggest in this moment? Um, we cannot permanently shift that burden to landlords and property owners. And I don't think that anyone intends to do that. Like I said, I think uh, we have instituted stopgap measures at every level of government while we figure out what we can do. One idea that I've pitched to our federal partners is there's an existing deduction for small landlords. They can deduct up to $25,000 in loss uh, if they make, I think, less than $150,000 a year. It's a deduction that a lot of landlords may not be aware of. but couldn't we do something like that, where we allow the full deduction for their loss uh, in exchange for not evicting their tenant? I mean, we have to recognize whether we are renters, homeowners, landlords, business owners, employees, we're all in this together. And what would have been fair or reasonable before this crisis would be disastrous to allow to happen now. Uh, which is mass evictions for, for non-payment of rent, for instance. It's just a totally different landscape. Uh, it's life or death for hundreds of thousands, uh, if not millions of people. And we're really gonna have to come together to seek solutions. But I wanna be clear, I absolutely do not believe that this uh, crisis can or should be solved in the backs of landlords. But we do need landlords to come to the table and come up with reasonable solutions. And so far, uh, Multifamily Northwest, who has been the, the biggest opponent to all of my tenant protections, and again, you know, supports my opponent, um, their solution is just pay us. We, we're out 35, I think at the beginning, it's probably more, I think it was, uh, we're forecasting a shortfall of $35 million a month in rent, pay us. Um, that's not going to happen. The city of Portland certainly doesn't have those resources, nor does the state of Oregon. So whether it's the federal government bringing pressure to bear on lenders to um, renegotiate mortgages with homeowners, whether it's allowing landlords to deduct, fully deduct their losses to, to recoup uh, come tax time, uh, whether it's creating a re relief fund where we're just giving them direct financial uh, aid, it's, you know, everything is on the table. No one has figured it out yet, including the people that have the most power to do something. I'm sitting on city council advocating for everything I can that's within my power and, and offering as many ideas as I can to our state and federal partners and my colleagues. Thank you. 
Mingus, I was going to offer a question to you somewhat along the same lines. How would you ban price gouging in the rental market? And uh, would you enact other rental protections? Oh, absolutely. First, if I, I may, first, I, I would love to have an opportunity to intervene in or to touch on some of the, the version of the question that you asked Commissioner Udaley. Um, we, you covered a lot of territory and a lot of interesting ideas that frankly come from jurisdictions that are not city government. Uh, my basic solution here, especially for renters, is let's just invest as many dollars as we can possibly find into emergency rental assistance. You know, what we want to do right now while the COVID virus is still amongst us is keep people inside. The most straightforward way to do that is to provide assistance so people can meet their rents. And then afterwards, I think we got to think in a bigger picture about some of the uh, reforms that we need to do in order to support um, uh, people who need housing and to bring more affordable housing to the city. Um, I completely agree with you. Um, and I actually, in many ways uh, and on many issues, I think uh, Commissioner Udaley has, part, has been part of an important movement to make uh, the housing market fairer for renters and that needs to be celebrated. Um, I think this election is about how do we make um, city government and the housing market work for people in the 21st century. I'm really excited uh, um, to do that. And again, again, I think our renter protections are an important part of that. Um, earlier today, I was just looking at the um, uh, uh, the Tenants Protection Ordinance, which has been uh, put out by uh, Portland Tenants United. You know, when you look through that, there are many things there which are very reasonable. In fact, I'd say 80% of that we can do right away. And the other sort of 20% are things that I think we're already doing. Um, you know, in addition to that, I very much support um, extending the uh, moratorium on evictions until we get past this COVID crisis. Um, a thing that hasn't been done in Portland, but I think really needs to be done in Portland is having me meaningful um, 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 anti-displacement policies. And again, I think um, as with the housing market, just like with police uh, um, and the Office of Civic Life, I, need to, I think we need to systematically evaluate each of these programs uh, um, for evidence of racism or racial discrimination. And when we find that, we need to change that. So those are some of the things that I'll do um, when I'm on city council to um, make the housing market fairer for renters. Where does that money come from, though, to magically just uh, make sure the rental assistance is there? Because I'm pretty darn sure I've seen a lot of work on that front. So where sure. would you come up with more money for that? It has to be federal, state. Um, it has to be federal, state, and local. You know, uh, one of the things I'm arguing is uh, the most fundamental basic need is housing. So when we have extra relief dollars to uh, uh, um, give out to the public, um, I think we should concentrate that in keeping people housed because we know once they uh, go outside, other problems compound quickly. I just spent the uh, part of yesterday evening uh, I'm wandering around some of our public parks talking to um, uh, residents were deeply concerned, both at a human level and a public safety level, about uh, the ways in which our uh, public parks have become sort of like favelas uh, um, in, many, in many ways. And that's the, the damage that's being done to people who are living outside right now is going to take years to uh, uh, heal. That's why I think we have to keep our public policy focused on keeping people inside. The most efficient way to do that is through emergency housing vouchers. Thank you. Um, so we talked about the about housing and the importance of housing, especially during the pandemic. Um, but kind of looking forward to um, uh, supporting the city through the, supporting the city's economy um, and businesses um, to help them get on a path to recovery. Um, what should the city do? And and I guess uh, sorry, Mingus, this would go to you first. Sure. Sure. Well, you know, we have to manage. We're in a chicken and egg situation here where we can't manage in order to open up the city again. We need to uh, manage the COVID crisis, uh, but it's hard to manage the COVID crisis if we open up again. So, you know, actually, that's why I really think that we need to focus in on issues surrounding houselessness. Um, as our weather turns, one of the things I think that we need to do is get everyone who's living on the streets um, into some sort of shelter. Um, right now, there are one 180 tents on the sidewalks in the Pearl District. You know, every day I talk to someone who say, Mengus, you know, I'm ready to open up my uh, restaurant again. I'm ready to open up my uh, law office again. Uh, but I have eight tents in front of my front door. Um, it just doesn't work. So just as a matter of uh, humanity and public health, we need to uh, 
organized. We need to figure out a place for folks to go. I think there's lots of opportunities here. Frankly, I've talked to people who own uh, parking lots and they've told me, you know, Mengus, if we would help people, I would let you use our parking lot for free. You know, um, I think that uh, sadly is true. Um, under right now, we have many office buildings which are basically vacant. Um, I think we have great examples of organized camps on the east side of the river uh, that are working well enough and provide a model for how we can go about getting people inside uh, so we can manage the public health crisis and the homelessness crisis. And then once we do that, I think we got to uh, focus in on cleaning up our streets. I think any I think I try to do at least once a week is take, take a walk through downtown uh, to see where we're doing and how we can make it better. And anyone who's done that recently has to come away with a broken heart. You know, um, our businesses are closed. Uh, homelessness is worse than it's ever been. Uh, there are broken windows and graffitis everywhere. Um, if you have any sort of retail business downtown, um, you got to be scared about the future. You know, uh, um, and part of what we do after we house um, our most vulnerable people is we need to clean up the streets, get rid of the graffiti, um, and create and work with local businesses so they can figure out how to open up again and how to make their business work in the post COVID economy. That's one of the things I'm excited about uh, um, for being on uh, in city council. It's going to require a lot of innovative. Um, innovation and change. And I think a lot of this change is going to be better um, than what the status quo used to be. Uh, but the first step is, to, you know, number one, to house people, then to clean up, provide people with basic public safety, and then work with businesses so that they can get back to uh, what Portland does best, which is like being great at small business. Great, thank you. Um, and Chloe, same question for you. Just uh, what can the city do to um, help shore up the economy and, and help businesses to, uh, to recover from the coronavirus pandemic? Oh, and you're, you're on mute. The um, two things that I have done or I'm currently doing is number one, working with our local business community through our Healthy Businesses Initiative that's run through PBOT. And that is uh, where we are issuing free permits for the duration of the shutdown to businesses for parking spots, for pickup drop-off, for dining, or even closing entire streets uh, for public plazas. That program has been really popular, very successful. I think we have 700 permits for either um, parking spots or plazas and the public is loving it as well. Uh, the second thing that I've done is I fought really hard in the conversation around the CARES Act funds uh, for assistance to some of our hardest hit, most vulnerable, small local businesses. Um, this is a point of departure from my opponent. While I absolutely support uh, rent assistance, we could have spent every one of those dollars on rent assistance. It would have been a drop in the bucket. It would have helped renters for uh, maybe a month, maybe. Uh, and then they would be back in the position that they're in now. We have to have our state and federal partners uh, intervene in this rent crisis. And we have to balance our investments in emergency rental assistance with assistance to our business community because those are people's livelihoods. Those jobs are how people pay rent. So by failing to invest in our small business community, we'd actually be creating more need for rental assistance. And it's a really challenging calculation. I think that we hit on a good, uh, a good compromise uh, with my colleagues. And then finally, I would say, yes, we absolutely have to get people off the street. Number one, because it's inhumane. Uh, it is expensive to serve people on the streets and the impact to the broader community, whether it's uh, to businesses' ability to operate or just our morale. I mean, it is heartbreaking to uh, travel around the city and see the conditions in which people are living. So I was very supportive of the establishment of those uh, sanctioned camps. My office has helped um, with a couple different uh, tiny, tiny home villages. We are looking at every PBOT property that could be suitable for camps. And I'm in conversations with the mayor uh, and I know this is also a top issue for Commissioner Hardesty. We're looking at every single resource we have, uh, 
even schools and community centers uh, that could be used as day centers and hygiene facilities and just let people have uh, safe spaces to rest and get cleaned up and do their laundry. Um, it's, it's, and, and this is one of the challenges of the multiple jurisdictions. This is city, county, metro owns properties, the state owns properties, there's federally owned properties, and then there's our school, uh, our school districts. So I've asked the mayor to convene a conversation between those stakeholders. Um, I really wish this is something we had done at the beginning of the crisis, but you know, as I said, we haven't hit bottom and we can't see the other side. I, we, we, didn't, we didn't know what we know today and so it's, it's really high time that we kind of assess all of our resources and assets and make sure that we're, we're utilizing them and we're taking care of everyone. And I apologize because I, I lost track of time, but I, I did want to make sure to ask one more question of you, Chloe. And, and that's, you, you've been criticized at times for um, um, your personal style in dealing with either people or uh, those who don't agree with your policies. Um, and that's been, you know, one of the, um, a, a big concern for us kind of throughout your term in terms of um, uh, a lack of collegiality at times or um, uh, um, just your interactions with media, et cetera. Can you address that in terms of, um, you know, whether that is whether you think that that is an issue or if it's you know your 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 view of kind of those criticisms well when it comes to my colleagues i would say it's absolutely overblown um if you look at the record of the last four years you will see that uh city council has largely been in agreement on um, probably 90 percent or more of the items that have come uh to us and there have been a few notable exceptions and a couple, you know, hotly contested issues. We weren't elected to fall into lockstep with each other. We were elected to represent uh, our constituencies and pursue uh, our kind of values and uh, priorities. So I, I would reject that notion uh, with my colleagues. I'm currently working with all of them on different, <laughs> on different issues. It's, you know, we don't hold grudges. You have an argument, you have a disagreement, you move on. But like I mentioned earlier, with the exception of code change, every major piece of legislation that I've brought has received four to five votes. That's not the record of someone that has a hard time uh, building relationships with colleagues. The complaints uh, from the public, I would say, you know, I am reaching out to and really centering communities that have historically been left out. So if there's a perception of me not listening, um, you know, you could, I mean, I just, my, the, the last four years of my life flashes before my eyes and the probably, uh, the hundreds or possibly thousands of people that I have met with over the course of uh, developing policies or participating in town halls. Um, often when people don't hear the answer they want from you, they say that you're not, that you're not listening. And maybe I'm not a conventional politician in that um, I'm very straightforward and I'm not going to, uh, I'm very straightforward about my, about my positions. And I feel a sense of urgency about the issues that I am, that I ran on and that I am here to address. And I've gotten a lot done in the last four years. I'm, I'm proud of that track record. And, uh, if I was interested in being, I guess, a lifelong career politician, maybe I would do a lot more elbow rubbing and glad handing and uh, cozy up to the people that I guess politicians typically are supposed to, but um, it's, it's absolutely false to claim uh, that I don't 
that I don't get along with people or I can't build relationships. I mean, you can look at my list of endorsers. You can look at the incredible coalition that came, uh, came together to support code change and many of the other you know, biggest policy pieces I've led. And then with the media, I would say, um, yeah, I've, I've had some issues with media and I've always had issues with media. I mean, part of the reason that I went into um, independent book selling was to really support independent media out of concern for the <clears throat> rapid consolidation of, of our media in the hands of just a few multinational uh, corporations. And I take journalism very seriously and recognize the absolutely critical role that local media plays in delivering timely, unbiased information to the public so they can meaningfully participate in these conversations. And so when I detect a bias or just actual misinformation shared in the media, um, it's, it definitely uh, riles me up. But, uh, you know, every, you start over fresh every day. I mean, I'm, the Oregonian has never been a particularly big fan of mine, but I uh, have agreed to almost every interview you've requested. If I haven't agreed, it's probably just because I didn't have the time uh, that day to satisfy the request. And I do, I do these interviews. Um, and, you know, I, I also have to say, I do feel like there, that gender plays a role in some of these criticisms. I am criticized for how I look, how I dress, what kind of shoes I've worn, the tone of my voice, the cadence of my speech, my weight, how much I smile. I mean, men generally do not receive this level of kind of scrutiny and criticism of their appearance or of how they present, present themselves. And so I, I take, while I recognize that, uh, you know, I love a good debate, I can be blunt, uh, and that that can rub some people the wrong way. Um, I also take those criticisms with a grain of salt because of the challenges that I face as a woman in public office. Great. Thank you both. And I'm sorry to um, have taken more than the hour that we promised. Okay. But it was, I think, a, a great conversation. Um, we really appreciate both of you uh, joining us today. And we'll be in touch as we move forward. But thank you. Thank great. you. Great questions. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. -bye. Great. Bye. Great.